firstly, I just want to say welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us for this ASA virtual talk um, with Brian Stockwell on the trials and tribulations of the first British school science experiment in space. Um, I'm really delighted we had over 100 people book for this, which is just incredible. Um, so I firstly want to say thank you all for booking. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many faces, some of which I recognise and some of which are new. Um, so thank you. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I've already said about the mic, so that's fine. Um, and we are recording this talk as well. Um, we will put it onto our Ashford School YouTube channel afterwards. So if there are other alumni or maybe your parents want to watch it or other staff members, please do um, share that link with them afterwards so they can enjoy the talk too. Um, but without further ado, I am delighted to introduce you all to Brian Stockwell, many of whom I'm pretty sure will remember with great admiration and fondness. Um, Brian was Head of Science and Physics here at Ashford School from 1975 to 2001. Um, and as part of his role um, teaching, he also led the Christmas lecture series with Mrs Williams, um, which was for our local primary schools, and was also the mastermind behind this British science experiment that went up into space um, yes. so I am delighted uh, to hand over to Brian to take us through all the trials and tribulations that him and the team faced so thank you Brian. Okay. Well, well thank you ever so much everyone and thank you all for, for, for coming to see it I'm, uh, I'm, I just wish I could be there and see you in person and have a real chat it would be it would be really um, lovely. Uh, Anyway, um, it would be lovely if um, uh, uh, Sheena and Sarah and Lara, the original space uh, girls, could unmute themselves um, because um, there's certain um, bits of the show or the slides that I would love you to be able to uh, answer questions on and, and so on. Okay. Um, so, um, I think the best thing is for me to try and share my screen now and um, get started and then uh, probably all sorts of questions that will appear. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen <clears throat> and start a slideshow with luck. So I'm hoping that you can all see that. Yes, thank you. Good. Um, so while you're having a quick look at that, um, I would just perhaps like to answer one or two questions which have already been asked me. One was several people said, how are you? Well, I'm fine. And uh, I still do a lot of walking with the local U3A group, which is uh, good. And I still go diving, which someone else asked. And one of the big delights for me this last year was um, teaching my two granddaughters to dive. And um, uh, they have now got their first qualification. So that's been, you know, a, quite a delight. Um, so that really sums up the um, experiment, the little um, description there, which you've probably had time to have a look at. No, it doesn't say anything. Pardon? Can we see the rest of it? Or can you not see the bottom? No. No, I, I can see as far as this exhibition. Ah, okay. Just a second. No, just a second. Something's gone wrong. Let me go back. Right. Okay, so the last bit says, this exhibition charts the seven-year history of Ashford School's experiment and explains how the school achieved the goal of putting the first British school experiment into space. Okay? Okay, thanks. Right, uh, next slide is our original competition explanation. And um, uh, this is courtesy of Sheena, I'm sad to say, because I've, I've lost mine long ago, or I don't know where it is. Um, and there's some small print down the bottom here saying, um, we will undertake to build and assemble it at our own cost and from our own resources in accordance with NASA regulation. <laughs> I don't know if we really looked at that or not in great detail. 
and and here's our actual application. Now, for some reason, there we are. That's Lara's writing. Very neat. I thought it was, but I wasn't sure. Is Lara there? I'm here, Brian. Yes. Oh, lovely, Lara. I, I didn't automatically even recognise it as my writing, to be honest. But, oh. but I reckon it, it probably is. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, lovely. Right, I did wonder if it was yours, but I wasn't 100% sure. I'm not <laughs> expecting everyone to read the whole application, but that just sort of shows you a little bit about what it was. And, and this is courtesy of Sheena, who actually uh, uh, still had <laughs> the original competition. Now, for some reason, why is it not moving on? Oh, there we are. Uh, that's the original um, drawing we put into the application. I'm not sure who drew that, whether that was Sheena or Amy or... Uh, it, was, it was me, it was Sarah, that's my writing. Oh, hello, Sarah. I can't see you, but uh, it's lovely to hear you. <laughs> I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Uh, and so they were the original things. Now, what I'm hoping to do now is to show you a little bit of the videos. I've actually got six original clips. They're only about a minute or two Some each. Ideas. The judges decided for Ashford, and if Ashford's garden grows, it'll be in the astronauts' diets. More than 100 schools took up ITN's challenge to design an experiment to fly in the space shuttle. Today, after months of work and careful selection, the six finalists arrived at the Science Museum to see if they could pass the final hurdle. A judge panel of six distinguished scientists, many of them acknowledged experts in space technology, spent more than three hours studying the experiments. Presenting the awards, the science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, best known for his book 2001, film sequel to which received a royal premiere last night. The first prize goes to Ashford School for Girls. Experiment with a chemical garden which goes vertically on Earth, grows spherically in space. The idea of growing a chemical garden in space was one the girls came up with in their junior science club. The chemicals grow like a coral reef when seen on Earth. The girls want to know how they'll grow without gravity. ITN's Pam Armstrong is an old girl of the winning school. A happy coincidence. She was there to announce the runners-up. The team from Matthew Humberston's Comprehensive in Cleethorpes. Their experiment to test how alloys will form in space. After the presentations, the winners talked to two of the Britons who could be flying on the shuttle next year. Possibly with their own experiment on board. It hasn't really sunk in yet, but still, we're really pleased. It's fantastic. Oh, we're extremely pleased, but as Sarah said, I don't think it's quite sunk in yet. Is there a lot of work ahead? Yes, there is a lot. Um, on the design, basically, how we're going to cope with the temperature and vibration is going to be. So that was the start of it all. And uh, that's one of the original things we were uh, given. Um, uh, <clears throat> and presented by Arthur C. Clarke. So we then started to get used to the idea of what we were doing. And um, this is one of the original sheets, as it were, that sort of told us what we were supposed to be doing. Um, I'm having a bit of trouble getting people's, oh, there we are, pictures out, there we are. Um, so th this, th these containers were strapped to the side of the um, space shuttle cargo bay. They're like that. Um, there's the big ones. They're five cubic feet. And we were supposed to have a small one like that, two and a half cubic feet one. And, and they fit like this. So you make your experiment up and you, you get a base plate like that and you fit it in it, and then it goes in this insulated pressurized container, and then it goes into the cargo bay, as simple as that, if you're lucky. So this is, <laughs> this is um, Sheena and Lara, and this is a stage, I think, where I don't think we really knew what we were doing. <laughs> we sort of um, 
were a bit um, at the lost stage, I would call it. Um, we had a lot of information to pass backwards and forwards. We had a thing called a payload accommodations requirement, and we had a safety data package to deal with, which I'll show you here. This was some of the first documentation, documentation we sent. Um, I'm not expecting you to read it all. It just tells them approximately what we were doing um, and uh, some of the descriptions of our experiment. And the same with that. That was, that was what we called our PAR documentation. And if I remember rightly, that went off somewhere in that same year of 1985. Seems ages ago now, doesn't it? And, and one, that's the four of the original girls who um, uh, I think we, we were helped by um, the University of Kent in Canterbury. And one of the things they said to me was make cardboard models. And I thought, great, we can cope with that. That sounds easy. So we'll do that. And um, we made a load of models to sort of see how we could fit everything in. Um, made it easier. That was, uh, I think, possibly that Christmas or so of 1985, somewhere around there. And we actually managed to choose cameras and things like that. We've gone from having a cine camera idea to having these rather posh cameras, which Canon lent us, supposedly lent us. Um, and that, I believe, is Lara and Sheena doing some testing on the camera, just testing probably the um, depths of field and things like that. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, someone even made a model for us to sort of take photos of. <laughs> and now we have a next clip, which is, I believe, from about Christmas 1985. For some reason, I can't move it. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, sorry. Why is it not starting? The four yeah, girls yeah. have spent literally hundreds of hours at the laboratory bench since winning the competition. Their original idea was to grow what's called a chemical garden in space. An idea simple enough in itself, but as the last few months have shown, the technical side of putting it together has been an exact task. One of the difficulties they've had to overcome is arranging for photographs to be taken at the garden. Timing, focusing, and firing off the camera and experimenting on space. And using a slide projector, they've also been spending a great deal of their time studying the mechanisms and process behind the garden. When certain chemicals are mixed together, they grow like corals. The effect was first observed 300 years ago when an iron tree was grown in this way. The underlying principles behind the process are still not fully understood. Thanks to the technology, the girls already have their own ideas about how the chemicals will react when they're released from the grip of gravity. in the United States, which helps them smooth over any problems which might crop up in the design of their experiments. When we look back at our very first designs, they seem so basic and sort of crude that mm. we've changed so much. They've developed now much more complicated. The shape of things to come in the chemical garden should finally be known when it reaches orbit aboard the space shuttle next summer. David Chater, News at One, in Ashford. I, lo I love the way they said next summer, if you think about it, that was December 1985 and they thought it was all going to happen in about six months, um, but lots of things happened between then. Um, I feel as if I ought to explain a little bit about Lee Gang Rings, which was another experiment we were going to send up at the same time. And on Earth, you can put one chemical in a jelly this is potassium chromate in gelatin and silver nitrate in the middle and they react. And where it precipitates, it produces a black line. And because the moving chemical, the one that's moving outwards precipitates, it then hasn't got enough concentration to give another 
precipitate until a certain distance. So you get these lines produced, which is not important on Earth because you, you very rarely uh, have one chemical diffusing into another. But if you mix chemicals in space, um, you will have problems because you'll have one, if you have them, two chemicals will not mix naturally or in space because there's no convection. And so it's a theoretical problem which could occur uh, as a problem in the future. Um, now, they don't always work very well. Anyway, we, we did also manage to get least gang rings to work in a tube. So that tube on the bottom there has got rather beautiful little rings in and they're the typical rings. And we, we were hoping to do that in space with big wide tubes because uh, in space you don't get convection. Whereas, uh, so we, but we had to do it in a very small tube there down the bottom here in order to stop convection. Convection goes up and down. So that was our design tube to, to work our least gang ring apparatus. And there they are making this box, which um, we uh, were going to work, were constructing made of fiber lamb, which is basically the same sort of stuff that um, is used on aircraft floors, I believe. Uh, very strong. We also had a computer-aided design system, which uh, Amy got to be the expert on that, and we drew our plans on that. And these are some of our preliminary plans where we've got the chemical garden container up the top there, and we've got um, flash guns here, both sides, with the electronics. And we've got uh, a couple of big batteries here. We weren't sure how many we'd need. And there's one, one camera down there. Um, and there's the design we ended up with, with uh, for the chemical garden, which um, had two tubes, two concentric tubes. And we put the crystals in the middle there. And we put the sodium silicate round on the outside because we wanted to make sure those crystals ended up in the middle of the solution when we started taking photographs. And this was the springs and so on to make it work. <clears throat> so this was one of the first um, big uh, stages, what was called the preliminary safety data package. And um, we were quite proud of this. And um, I can't remember if I did most of it or we all did most of it or what, but there was a lot of safety data in it. And um, uh, you'll see, and this was presented roughly speaking, January, 1986. And something special happened then as well, which will be referred to in this little clip. Despite the recent disaster, they've been told by NASA to continue their preparations. They're off now, it says BBC. A chemical garden to send into space. Cobalt nitrate grows into coral-like shapes in a solution of sodium silicate here on Earth. They want to discover the effect zero gravity has on it. Putting it on a turntable gives some idea of the effect weightlessness might have. Their other experiment is to discover what happens in space to the least gang rings that form when two chemicals, one a jelly and one a liquid, are put together. Since winning the competition, Sarah Bryce, Amy Brown, Laura Dukes and Sheena McLagan have been working on how to put their experiments into a sealed container that mustn't weigh more than 60 pounds. Several firms have given them equipment, including a computer-aided design system that produces enlarged working plans. Last week, they sent NASA details of their experiments for safety checks, and with the help of physics teacher Brian Stockwell, they've now finished the box the experiments will go in. This is the box we've built. It's uh, made of fiber lamp. It's very light material. We've built this box. Here we are attaching the last three of the So NASA 
been in touch with you since the Challenger disaster? And what did they have to say? Oh, yes, yeah, so I have a technical manager in That's um, when I had the hair. Space Flight Center, NASA, who actually phoned me up and said that we're just to carry on as usual and uh, prepare the experiment and get it ready. And uh, he hopes it will be flown as soon as possible. Have you any idea when that will be? Well, no, not now. Um, we hope in maybe six months, maybe a bit longer. It's only a small payload, so it may well be that they'll fit it in fairly easily. The school can link up with NASA's computer to get the latest on the shuttle program. And once the investigation into the Challenger disaster is complete, they'll be watching here for a day. But despite the recent disaster, they've been told... So, so the interesting thing there was the date, of course. They suggest, I, I suggested maybe six months of course we didn't realize it would be quite you know the four or five years six years before it happened um but just before the clip i was talking about this safety data package which we'd sent and we were very proud of it well you can see what happened when it came back it came back with all this writing on it saying you know needs a gsc package conducting ground operations plans then assess activities for hazards if identified, do a hazard report, listing controls. All personnel hazards are considered catastrophic at Kennedy Space Center. So, so we were a bit deflated after that, and we had to submit a hazard report uh, for review. So, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that um, yeah, we, got, we, we were quite excited originally. Now, this would be somewhere around um, February 1986 now. Now I won't, I won't promise that all the things, that everything is in exactly the right order. So here's the inside of this safety data package, which had been marked by NASA engineers. And here we are. It's a bit much, you know, when you're a physics teacher or a teacher anyway, getting, getting your work marked. <laughs> Here we are, need a more detailed circuitry to show all the fusing and safety devices. And down here, include a drawing of the thermal control circuit. Specify what is the operating temperature. So, yes, we were a little deflated after that. Um, yeah, this, this um, formula is in my writing, but I don't think... Um, I think it must have come from NASA and we had to use it to work out the temperature that the container would get to if it was left because we needed to know how much battery power to use to keep the thing warm. In other words, we had to keep it above a certain temperature. So we... Uh, uh, I'm just trying to move something, just a minute. Uh, oh no, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Just a minute. Back, here we are. Um, anyway, I, th I have a feeling there might be an Alex on the Zoom meeting at the moment. Alex, who was Alex Hardy. And I'm sure you were a little bit older than the, the original Space Girls. And you were in the sixth form. And I think you, uh, measured the thermal conductivity of the um, fiber lamb so that we could put the answer into this formula. I suppose, oh, wow. Did I? <laughs> I think so. Yes. <laughs> I do remember doing all sorts of things with formulae, which I yeah. hoped was useful, but yeah. was never really sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you did. I think you did. I, that's how I remember it. Right. Great. Oh, well, that's, 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 that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. um, th this is the electronics interface board. This was the thing that was going to drive all the various uh, devices because basically NASA just had three switches. So there were just three switches up here, which switched everything on. And we had to then use those three switches to turn our computer on and then switch all our various devices on. Um, and this is the circuit board which was made uh, to do that. So the, this was the circuit board that was the, the circuit diagram above. And that's just a nice picture. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure when that was taken, 
whether you were six formers by then, so um, maybe that was a year or two after those original bits of work. We did flash guns. There's one flash gun. I, don't, I have a feeling that's Amy, but I'm not sure. But it may be someone else. Anyway, someone was taking the flash guns apart and um, reassembling them so that we, we could fit them in. Um, now, this one, you might, if you look really carefully, you might see whoever did that experiment. It looks almost like it might be Lara's writing. I'm not sure. Um, but it, it um, anyway, it, it was just testing the batteries because basically we, we had these commercial batteries, these big Duracell batteries, and we needed to know how long they'd last, which is what we were doing on this chart recorder. And basically we're just measuring the current and the voltage and, and, and seeing how long they would last. Simple, it's fairly simple physics experiment. And look, I think we're getting on a bit further now, a few years later, because this is Alison uh, Williams and I think Debbie, uh, but I can't remember her other name. Uh, someone will tell me, I expect. Webster, um, Debbie Webster. Ah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And they did most of the programming of the uh, computer using uh, a BBC computer. Um, we had a lot of advice from um, British Aerospace. They were incredibly helpful. Um, uh, the uh, they used to come and visit us and tell us, you know, what was best to do and, and how to do things. It was, they were very, very helpful. In fact, they produced a complete 50-page um, uh, document here of all the different um, um, forces that were acting and the talks on them uh, during launch. And... Um, uh, th this I, I, I assume is somewhere hidden away at school along with a lot of other things that it's not necessarily easy to find. Um, I can't remember, maybe Sheena, Lara or, or Sarah will be able to help me, whether we actually cut the brackets or did we cut them or did we design them or did we, I know we had fun because they were made of an aluminium alloy 2024. And I remember the British Aerospace people telling me, oh, you've got to have them tempered to T18, I think it was. And then we made them and we tried to bend them and they broke. And, <laughs> um, and I, I remember getting back to them and they said, oh, they shouldn't do that. And in the end, I think they made the brackets, but whether we cut them out or what, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I certainly, I remember being given all the measurements to make them, but whether we actually did or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I remember doing all the fiber lamb stuff. Um, yeah, well, maybe. maybe. Can I, can I, say, um, I think um, Helen remembers as well. We actually did help at some stage with, I think it was drilling the holes in the brackets. I oh. can't remember what else we did, but we remember doing something with brackets. Oh, right. oh, well, we probably did do quite a bit of it then. Yeah, there were certainly a lot of brackets there, but I have a feeling they did the bending or something. So um, um, uh, maybe we made them and then they bent them and then we ho drilled holes. I'm not sure. Anyway, I've just got a big long list here of all the different firms that helped us just to give you an idea of how much help we had. Um, uh, I mean, firms were ever so good because you know, we only had to seem to ask them and they would give us things. Um, I mean, I suppose it was a, you know, it was, it was something they, they were keen to help with and it was good for their publicity. So I think, you know, that was why they did it. Um, I mean, here again, this is the continuation of the list of, of people who helped. Um, <clears throat> and work was gradually completed. Um, I can't, oh yes, now I can see down here that the 
um, the first stage of the uh, electronics was put in there on top of the second stage of two, two layers of it. And that's, that's uh, uh, with the actual Scorpion computer, that's a single board computer that, was, that we used in the end. In fact, we did quite a bit of work using one computer and then we changed over to this commercially available one. Oh, and there you can see the two cameras, one on top of the other. And of course, some of the brackets, which um, maybe we, we did most of it and they did some of it, um, I forget. <laughs> That was me just being silly, I think. <clears throat> yeah, I've got a, there's a list there of about, um, yeah, 40 odd girls and nine staff who helped one way or another. This is just another nice picture. I, I don't remember who people were, but they were, that's one of the pictures that's still up in the science rooms, I think. That's it nearly complete and where the, um, uh, the little display units were there. Um, the, um, all the wires were put in, ready. Um, so now we have another clip, which um, I will show you. The project has been designed by girls at Ashford School in Kent, and it won its journey on the space shuttle in an ITN competition six years ago. Six of the 30 girls from Ashford School who worked on the space experiment watched confidently the British aerospace engineers subjected the result of their hard work to the kind of vibrations it will suffer during launch on the space shuttle next spring. Since left Ashford School, but others have kept the experiment going despite delays because of the Challenger disaster. They're aiming to find out whether so-called chemical gardens grow vertically in the weightlessness of space, as they do back on Earth. For most of the girls, working on the experiment has been fun, but it's led to jobs at British Aerospace for two of them, twins Natasha and Sophie Duncan. I was always been interested in space. It's an inspirational area. And thinking about working on satellites um, was really inspired me, and I wanted to come here because, I mean, I think my dream really would be to work on a space station. It's over and the moment of truth for the Ashford experiment. Has it met NASA's tough standards? Hello. All the complex equipment the school had built stood up perfectly, but a commercially supplied battery had shorted and leaked. They think they can fix it, but time is running out before next spring shuttle launch. We're back at 6.30, that's all for now. Good afternoon. Um, so, yes, that was uh, a bit of a disappointment. And in actual fact, it was quite um, a difficult problem to solve at the time because um, we had the, uh, the, um, the battery had shorted and quite honestly, we weren't 100% sure what had caused it. And it took some time for me to check it through. And what had happened was those are commercially supplied batteries. And the, for those of you who understand a bit of physics, well, it's not difficult. Um, the, um, the positive wire, some of the batteries the positive wire was actually touching the case or close to the case. And in the vibration test, the wire had actually touched the case. And because we had the case connected to the negative, because it had these metal straps on, it, it mattered. A lot of applications, it wouldn't matter. But that, that was the reason for that. So um, anyway, um, it was solved. It just meant a matter of finding lots of batteries and, and testing them all. So yes, we had a lovely, um, and this is courtesy of Sheena as well, because she has still kept her, uh, her launch uh, invitation. That was an invitation to the launch. And this is uh, more girls and me still with some hair and ready to be shipped or getting it ready. 
And there's another one with us sort of putting it together still. Just another picture because there's more people there. And yet another picture with more people putting it together, <laughs> just because I think some of them are different. And there was a final send off from the headmistress, um, Mrs. McCare at the time. So, and this is pictures a lot of you may not have seen. Um, this is me over at Kennedy Space Center doing the final setting up because although we could send most of it set up uh, from the school and it went straight over, uh, I had to put the chemicals in when I was over there and uh, do the final checking up. And in fact, here's the, uh, the technicians doing the final checking of the final wiring and, and just making sure that our circuits uh, were going to be all right compared to those, com compared to their circuits, you know, and they actually connected up correctly. And then the final putting in of the container so in fact, that's the experiment finally going in to the container and um, being sealed up. So now we have another um, little clip. Much of the whole eight years work really to have actually got it on the shuttle and know that it's in the cargo bay at the moment and actually ready for launch. Yes, I mean, our nerve wracking time really will be whether all the switches and the fuses and the solenoids and everything work properly. Tomorrow, 12 girls fly out to Florida to watch the blast off and finally bring to an end their longest ever physics lesson. Commander, who gives the leading away? The seven-member crew boarded Endeavour after a flawless countdown towards the 50th shuttle launch. A 50th for NASA, but a special first for the girls of Ashford School, winners of the ITN-sponsored competition to put an experiment in space. It was a moment the girls had waited years to see. Amazing. I've never seen anything like it in my whole life. It was actually brilliant. It's just, it's so nice to be able to think that our experiment is now. And uh, it's really nice just to see everything sort of finally come to fruition after about seven years of working hard at it. Tremendous that the school's done it, yeah, yeah. A great credit to all the girls who've done it, really, yeah. Endeavour is also carrying the first black woman into space and the first astronaut and space lab from Japan. Instead, attention will probably be focused on experiments into weightlessness, and not least how Ashford School's chemical gardens will grow. Oh, I didn't well. mean to start that again, sorry. Um, yeah, this is um, some of the, uh, the fun. We went to Kennedy Space Centre and there's Sophie and Natasha, who I believe are with us today, uh, which is rather nice. Um, and, and actually one of their questions was, um, was it a nightmare sorting out uh, uh, the trip to, uh, uh, Ken to Kennedy Space Centre or to the, the United States? Well. My answer to that is uh, after the whole eight years of, um, of worry and so on of getting an experiment on board, just, just getting uh, 12 people, um, well, 12, uh, 12 young ladies and myself over to America was relatively easy. <laughs> we also visited Disney World um, for free. Um, we, um, we, we persuaded them that we were a, a good case for uh, sponsoring us, I think, and um, we were all let in for free, which was very nice. And I, 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 did we go to Universal Studios? I don't oh. think I did. Oh, well, I've got this picture listed on the, in the same place, and I thought, I thought, oh, maybe this is Universal Studios. Well, maybe we didn't. Let's go on then. So, uh, I know shopping was on the list for all you young ladies. <laughs> and this, this was me going back to America and opening the container up again after the flight. And we, we saw the flight. I've, I felt we were so, so lucky not to have the shuttle flight delayed because 
we booked a certain week and we'd gone over that week and we went on, I think the, the flight was scheduled for the Thursday and I think we went back home again on about the Saturday or the Sunday. Anyway, then I had to go back again after the flight and, and get the experiment out. And uh, yeah, I think you could tell I could, I looked in the box and I could see that the chemical garden experiment had worked. And um, so I was delighted. Unfortunately, the least gang ring one, the solenoid hadn't worked, so that didn't work, but the other one did. And um, I don't know if you can see it, it's not a particularly good picture, but one of the technicians open, opened it up and I wasn't there at the time and they put this crocodile in as if the crocodile was coming out of the box at some time. <laughs> And so we now have a last little bit of a clip, which is, um, I believe, that the Science Museum. Two space experiments designed by British schoolgirls and launched on the American Space Shuttle Endeavour in September go on show at the Science Museum in London today. They're part of ITN's in Experiment in Space project, which was started seven years ago. This is the Ashford School experiment that flew in space for eight days on the Shuttle Endeavour earlier this year. Today, the Science Museum unveiled a special exhibition in honour of the experiment, thought up by four girls from the Kent School seven years ago. It all started in 1985, when the girls entered the idea of chemical gardens, fantastic shapes created by some chemicals in a special solution in an ITN competition. They wanted to see whether in space, the chemicals will grow upwards as they did in Earth's gravity. Seven years of hard work later, delayed by the tragic accident to the Challenger, the experiment flew on the Endeavour. It's amazing. I've never seen anything like it my whole life. It was actually brilliant. Three of the original four were at the Science Museum today, fresh from watching the launch in Florida. It was very impressive. The end problem was it all happened so quickly that, you know, you blinked and missed the whole thing. But um, afterwards, you know, it's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction that something's up there floating about. It's yours. The results now on display in the museum were a stunning success. Photographs taken in space show that the chemicals don't grow upwards, but in strange spirals. It's incredible. I can't, I can't believe how far it's progressed. It's completely different. Two of the girls are now medical students, another a physicist. After they'd left Ashford School, many others joined the team that built the experiment that has now claimed its place in scientific history. Lawrence McGinty, ITN, at the Science Museum. Um, so there we are. Um, that's one of the first pictures that were taken. There was about a hundred taken altogether. And that was when the rods first pulled apart. That was slightly further apart. And this is one of the end ones, which actually shows some of these unusual spiral shapes that we, we managed to pick up. And well, there's another one with a, a further extension. So that is about it. I've, I've done it quicker than I thought I would. So we'll go back to um, hearing everyone's, if Hannah can, oh, I'll stop the share. There we are. Now we're back to seeing everyone. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Firstly, before we go on to questions, thank you so much, Brian. It was really interesting. Yeah. And after being at Ashford School myself and walking past the space shuttle on the science corridor uh, every day, it's really nice to know a bit more about the history and the project behind it. So, yeah. so thank you. Um, so I know uh, some people submitted some questions in advance. So I've kind of um, I've got a big sheet of them here um, yeah. so we can go through those um, and then yeah. obviously if anyone else has any other questions um, you can raise your hand or um, you can pop the questions in the chat which I've got up on the side of my screen and um, whatever you guys would prefer to do really. Yeah. Um, so we had one question from um, Laura Hebblethwaite which was were there any follow-up experiments you would have liked to have done um, after you sent these two up? Well, I suppose I would have liked to have redone the Lee Gang Ring experiment. You know, that would have been good because, uh, but it would have had to be redesigned completely because 
um, basically there was something wrong with the um, the way we were pulling the it, it, it had a series of tubes and um, a valves and, and the valves were just too stiff and although we could work it on earth sometimes you know it was just bad luck that it didn't work in space I mean it's um, so I suppose that that would have been nice to have done but when you spent seven years doing something, you know, you do get to the stage where you, you think, oh gosh, there must be more in life to a space experiment. <laughs> I guess this next question kind of ties in. Um, Stephanie Evans said, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when designing the space experiment? So do you think that, do you think back to the least regard rings or? Is yeah, I think the least gang rings, we shouldn't, yeah. I mean, I mean, someone once, I think someone asked me, you know, why I ended up as a physics teacher and, and yeah. what else would I have done? I think, I think actually it was someone like, um, it was uh, Elfie, uh, Eleanor Fell, or who was Eleanor Fell, and also Alison uh, Hickman, who um, did work on the experiment. And um, uh, what, I would, what I would have said was that, I, I sort of drifted into physics, really, as it was one of the subjects I, I, can, I, I could do. I mean, um, physics and maths were my two main things. But uh, when I left school, uh, actually, I did my A-levels at um, a technical college, um, there was very little careers advice. And I think if I'd have had more careers advice, I might have ended up in engineering. And in which case I'd have been better, better qualified to, to build this experiment. I mean, in actual fact, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy teaching. I enjoyed it immensely. And, uh, you know, thanks to all you lovely ladies that I had the joy of teaching, you know, which, um, you know, has been a delight. But that sort of answers, you know, some of that, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and... Would you like to go to space now, now that it's becoming more accessible? I'm too old. You need more hair. Um, <laughs> no, you, no, you just, um, no, I, I, I would love to, yes. I mean, I still love, um, I mean, I live near Alton Towers. I live in Ashbourne, near Ashbourne, in, and, and I go with, to uh, Alton Towers with the grandchildren, and uh, I go on all the rides, you know, and... Um, uh, so yeah, and I still still go diving, which is sort of weightless. So um, yeah, I, um, I I enjoy things like that. Yes, if I had the chance to go into space, I would, but I'm probably you know not not likely now. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had the chance to do it again, what well now, what experiment um, would you send into space now? Oh, I think now. I mean, it's interesting now that that a lot of space experiments now are done in, in the form of micro satellites. You know, there's a lot of small things. I mean, really the space shuttle with its car, with its big cargo bay was ahead of its time in many ways. And, you know, our experiment that was just strapped on the side of the um, cargo bay was really, um, quite a clever way of doing it. You can't do that now. You know, most of it now is, is done by means of uh, putting it in a, in a satellite. In fact, I've got a little book here, which you can probably see. Um, you know, we were one of the first 100 of these uh, little experiments to go into space. Um, so, yeah, it's much more difficult now, I think, to put something into space than, than then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and Becky Chantry asked, how much change do you think the experiment brought to the science department and the interest of students in science? Well, I think I think it was it was it was lovely that it was done by a girls school, I think, you know, because, you know, girls are just as good as engineers as 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 boys. And, um, you know, uh, I've forgotten what the question was now. <laughs> <laughs> how, much, how much change do you think it? Oh, well, I think, I, think it, I think it just helped help the science department feel that they got a big project and and it was good publicity for the school and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we've also got another question from Mary Lewis. She said, um, "What were the long-term impact of the findings from the experiment? Do you know?" 
No, I mean, in the end, I got to the stage thinking that really the, ma the main purpose of the experiment is to give, if, give the girls of Ashford School uh, an idea of what engineering was like. And, you know, it certainly did that because we had, you know, safety documents to do and, and, and things to build and things to design. And, um, you know, it was a big engineering project, really. And um, I, I felt it was more important there than the fact that we managed to get chemical gardens. I mean, actually, quite interestingly, if you have a look, uh, I'm probably rambling on about something that's completely irrelevant, but... Um, uh, I've never had quite such a big audience to ramble on about <laughs> that long. <laughs> um, I forgot what I was going to say now. What was I going to say? Um, what was I talking about? Oh, God. <laughs> We'd ask uh, if you knew what the long-term findings of the experiment were. No. Uh, no, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say now. Sorry. No, that's fine. Give me another question that will come back to me. <laughs> Um, so Carolyn Chamberlain asked, um, and I'm not sure, you'll probably not be the best person to answer this actually, um, but what did the girls go on to do professionally um, after, well, afterwards? Uh, so the, if you really the last, yeah, the last bit of the video clip showed that um, uh, two of them had gone to be medical students um, and one had gone on to be physicists. Um, I mean, Sheena's better to answer that. What do you do now, Sheena? Yeah, so I'm, I'm still a, a doctor. I'm a radiologist. Um, Sarah, I think you're a geri geriatrician, is that right? Yeah, I work at Imperial in London. You keep medicine and uh, geriatrics and a smattering of COVID. Oh, right. <laughs> and um, I think Amy's a teacher, although Amy's unable oh. to be here with us. And Lara, where's Lara? I'm here, Brian. Um, oh. Well, I did I did a science degree and then um, actually I changed course and um, I actually worked in arts and culture for quite a long time. And, but these days I work for the Institute of Cancer Research in London, nearby Sarah at oh. Imperial. Uh, but I'm a, a director on the administration side, so well um, so not really a career in science. Well um, uh, but no. I, I would like to say, Brian, that you know the sense, the opportunity, and the sense of empowerment that you gave us was just amazing. Mm. And perhaps maybe we didn't realise it at the time, but certainly we do now. It was incredible. You were amazing. <laughs> Even science club and dismantling car engines and all sorts of things. It was incredible. Lovely. So thank Lovely. you. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to second that. I mean, it was um, it was really, you know, we, we would never have, have got to where we did without without Mr. Stockwell. So, um, you know, it's him that um, asked who would be interested at the very beginning and um, uh, and then carried the thing all the way through really. Um, mm. And I think it's only looking back now um, that I realise the amount of work um, that you must have put into it, Brian, because the, um, you know, at the time we just sort of turned up and, you know, made a bit of fibre lamb and <laughs> into a hexagon. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but there was so much more going on behind the scenes that, you know, you put into it. Um, so massive thank you. Thank you. The other, the other thing I was sort of going to say was that um, uh, I know the Challenger disaster was a great tragedy, uh, but if it hadn't been for that, we would never have finished the experiment in the year or so that people were expecting us to finish it in. And, you know, the Challenger disaster, although it was obviously a disaster, it, it was peculiarly our saviour in that we had then six or seven years to get it ready, which we would never have been, you know, we just couldn't do it as, because we did it one day a week, you know, well, one, one hour a week and uh, two hours a week and occasional weekends. And uh, there was a limit, of course, to, um, you know, how much you could spend. We weren't full-time engineers, that's the point. And, um, so it would have taken a lot longer. Yeah. Well, it did take a long time anyway. Yeah. yeah. 
and a couple of people have asked as well where the spot experiment is now. Um, so the space shuttle itself is still that it went up in is still in Ashford School. Um, it's all along the science corridor right by the physics classrooms. Um, yeah. And the board and the photo is up in uh, now what is Mr. Stoddart's phys physics classroom, which is where I did my A-level physics. Um, so it, it is still there. Um, I don't know about like the more internal uh, workings of the experiment. I don't know if the science museum still have them or no. The uh, science museum, the, the science museum display was was just a, 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 I don't know, a six or month, nine months uh, display, you know, they then turn it over and do another display. So that was only, you know, for the odd six months or so. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the schools got the uh, thing. I mean, the, the other thing I would say is that um, um, it's all documented in the school science review, which, um, uh, Alison Williams uh, wrote uh, an article about it and we're even on the front cover of it. So um, back in 1994 or whenever it was, that was, um, that was what we did. We put it all in that and, and that was that, yeah. Well, it is so lovely to see you all. I, I just wish I could have uh, been there in person and sort of uh, because uh, it's now 30 years, you know, this September since the launch. Uh, it just seems amazing and it's just amazing to see all of you people and uh, lovely to see you're all, uh, you know, I mean, you've all had careers and I mean, it's getting up to eight o'clock. I bet some of you have got children to put to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone else asked me, you know, what else I'm doing. I'm, I'm very lucky to have six grandchildren now. My two sons uh, did, um, uh, you know, they're married. I've got two lovely grand, um, no, two lovely um, daughter-in-laws, get the word right. Um, so, yeah, and I live fairly close to one of them, um, one of the uh, set, one of the families. So, yeah, I'm very, very happy. Yeah. Brian, can I just say, um, just to add to Lara and Sheena's comments about how amazing it was. I mean, it, I'm still slightly shell shocked watching those toe curling clips of like, <laughs> that, that. You know, my kids, for me, my kids look at me and went because it's it's people have have ribbed me about it, and particularly my brother for years and years and years. I've been, you know, s experiment and oh, talk about you know. So I haven't really talked about it. And then when this came up, and I said. And they looked at me and went, well, how and why? And I was like, oh, I was in the science club. And so there's been new, more, you know, sort of fuel to the whole general science club thing. But those, um, it, really brilliant to say a really fabulous talk and really, you know, amazingly put together. I love the handwritten application and the, you know, the payload document. And it is extraordinary looking at it. It makes me feel so old looking at it. It feels like it actually wasn't that long ago. Um, but but really fabulous. When I'm feeling a bit stronger, I might show my family bits of the recording, but it's just, <laughs> just, um, just brilliant. Really great to relive oh, it. And I, I think fantastic for girls in science. I mean, there are a lot of the girls' schools now that would, you know, would just sort of, you know, die to be able to have that opportunity and to win. So I also love that bit when they announce the winners and the cameras on the boys' school. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I must apologize, I meant to earlier, for the quality of the, um, uh, the um, video clips. It's because they've come off VHS tape and then they've gone on to something like DVDs, and then they've gone on to a hard drive, and then I've had to put them on the on the PowerPoint presentation. So you know they've gone from one thing to another. So uh, yeah, hence the quality is probably not that good. Yeah. Look at looking back now, I was wondering if they chose us to win just because of the Blazers making good telly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are great Blazers. <laughs> yes. Do they still have the same Blazers? We do, we do, we still have them. Um, so you can easily recognise us in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's great because they've been around since the 1920s. So really recognisable. And then all our boys have the Friars blazer, so the navy blue. So there's a bit of history for both of us, so oh, for yeah. the boys and the girls. Oh right, right, yeah. Oh excellent.
Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for sharing your time with us this evening. It really has been fascinating to hear all about it. Um, and I can tell that everyone else felt the same. So thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, and I just also wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending as well. It is really so wonderful to see so many faces um, and it, it just it's just brilliant to see our alumni community coming together. Um, so while you're here, I was just going to tell you about two events that we have coming up in person events, which is really exciting. Um, we have our sports tournament on Saturday, 26th of March. So if anyone fancies playing in a sports team, um, do drop me an email and let me know. Um, that will be at our prep school. And then we also also have our summer lunch on Saturday the 2nd of July um, and it would be absolutely wonderful to see some of you back at school and maybe to form tables of your year group or seeing as it's 30 years since the science experiment went up in space maybe we could have a science experiment table one or two um, so pop save the date for that um, and if you have any questions or you want to you have got an idea for an event or a talk and um, please do just drop me an email um, I'm I'm there for your ideas so any, any you have send my way um, but again thank you so much Brian and um, for your time and thank you everyone else <laughs>